So this video, we're going to talk about limiting reactants and percent yield. All right. And so to, to introduce the idea, let me going to, um, I'm going to use a scenario to help illustrate this point here. So we have Sally. Okay. Sally likes, you know, her favorite burger joint is called the jumbo burger joint. That's, that's just a place that she likes to go right now. Sally's just one, you know, one day she just had a huge craving. And so she decides to go to the, 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 the burger joint about, you know, three minutes before they close. Okay. Right. How dare she? So she goes, um, and she asked them to make, you know, her, the jumbo burger, right. And she wants as many jumbo burgers they could actually make. Okay. And so a jumbo burger, like what's a jumbo burger? Okay. Well, a jumbo burger consists of, so let's talk about how this jumbo burger look like. Uh, it consists of three meat patties. All right. It consists of six buns. It consists of 15 slices of onions, um, 20 slices of tomatoes. Um, let's see here. 10 slices. Whoops. My phone, 10 slices of pickles. All right. So that's, that's the jumbo burger. That's, that's what she likes. Right. I'm talking about the cholesterol, you know, <laughs> a heart attack in the box. All right. So she goes to them and she asks them to make them as many jumbo burgers as they possibly can. No more, no less, you know, and don't cheap out any of the ingredients. So, you know, the chef kind of goes in the back and see, okay, what does he have? All right. So when he goes in the back to see what he has, he noticed that he has 10 meat patties. All right. He has 30 buns. All right. He has 30 slices of onions left. All right. He has 60 slices of tomatoes left. All right. And about 55 slices of pickles left. Okay. Now the question is how many jumbled burgers can the chef actually make for Sally? Okay. Now, when you're looking at this, well, I think some of you guys know this. Well, he only really can make two full jumbo burgers, right? And if Sally is one of those who are anal enough and only wants a jumbo burger exact, right? All he could really make is two. And why you could say that is that when you're looking at and comparing um, each of these, you notice, okay, let me choose the one that's the smallest. Well, if you have three meat patties and you have 10 meat patties, well, theoretically, he could make three, right? six to 30. Well, you could technically make about five from just thinking about the buns alone. Well, the slices two, right? 15 times two is 30 from the slices, of tomatoes, three, and then from the slices of pickles. All right. So here we got about five. So if you choose the smallest one, then we'll say two. Well, then the most that he could possibly make for that he could make are two jumbo burgers. We will say that their slices of onions is your limiting ingredient because the amount of jumbo burgers that could be possibly made is limited by the onions. All right. So this is your limiting ingredient. All right. And it kind of works the same way within chemistry, right? Um, chemistry, oftentimes when you are mixing two reactants, you know how much of the reactants you have. Your reaction is going to end when the limiting reactant runs out. OK, once you lose a reactant, then there's no more reaction because a reactant is missing. Right. And so let's let's jump into an example so we can see exactly where I'm coming from. So B2O3. So we have this reaction, right? Plus three magnesium solids yield two boron solid plus three magnesium oxide solid. OK, so let's say. Um, that you start off with 2,350 grams of the boron oxide. All right. And it reacts with 3,580 grams of magnesium. Okay. And so what I want to know, um, is 
how much boron will I actually really make? Okay. And so what you need to do is that you need to figure out what is the limiting reactant. All right. Is though is it the boron oxide is your limiting reactant or is it the magnesium is the limiting reactant? Because whatever which one's the limiting reactant is going to determine how much of the boron you could actually really make. Okay. All right. Um, in this case, how much of the boron we're going to go to grams. So let's let's go to grams in this case. All right. All right. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we'll go through this process twice in which in what we kind of call this stoichiometry. That's the technical term. But what we're going to do is that we're going to convert the boron oxide. This is in grams. We'll convert this to moles first. All right. Then we'll do a mole mole ratio between the boron oxide and the boron itself and see how many moles of boron we'll make. OK, then we'll do it again. For the magnesium, we'll convert this first to mass, I mean, first to moles, all right? And then we'll do a mole-mole ratio between the magnesium and boron and to see how much we'll make from there, all right? So let's go with the first one. All right, so we're going to start off with 2,350 grams of B2O3, right? And so we're going to convert this to... Um, moles first so you look up the periodic table figure out what's the molar mass of boric oxide and we'll see that the molar mass of boric oxide is um so for every one mole of the boric oxide all right the molar mass is 69.6 grams per mole okay and so we could cancel out the grams um I don't know why I put my mold and volume. There it is. So we could cancel out the 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 um, grams of B2O3. All right. And then we're just left with moles of B2O3. Now we could go through a, a mole to mole ratio between B2O3 and boron, between boron oxide and the boron. And so when we do that, okay, we see that for every one mole of the boron oxide, we have two moles of boron, okay? So then we'll go ahead and put in a calculator. And when we do this, we get 67.6 .6 moles of boron, okay? So that's that. Now we have to do the same step with magnesium. All right, so with magnesium, we start out with 3,580 grams of magnesium, all right? So we got to convert this to to moles first all right and so we'll look up the molar mass of magnesium we see that for every one mole of magnesium according to the periodic table the molar mass of magnesium is 24.3 grams all right of magnesium so we could cross these out and then we're stuck with moles of magnesium all right now what we're going to do now we're going to do the mole ratio between magnesium and boron all right, and so by doing that, we see that for every three moles of magnesium, we form two moles of boron, okay? So now when you plug this into the calculator accordingly, right, we have 3,580 divided by 24.3 times two divided by three. Um, what you will get is about 98.0 moles of boron. Okay, so now, now what? Let's compare these two numbers. What do we get? Well, if we have this much of the boron oxide, we can make only 67.6 .6 moles of boron, okay? If we could completely react with all of the magnesium, all right, then we will be able to make 98.0 moles of boron. So how do we determine which one's the um, your limiting reactant or sometimes they say limiting reagent? Well, whatever um, makes the lower or the least amount of the product you're looking for. In this case, this is our smaller number. So that means B2O3 is our limiting reactant. All right. And so that means that um, in in reality, you can only really make this much because during the chemical reaction, if you are left to these two, and this is how much you have of each. You're going to run out of the boron oxide before you run out of the magnesium.
So the boron oxide is the limited reactant. All right. The magnesium, we say it's the excess. All right. Excess reactant. That means at the end of the reaction, you're going to have some of the magnesiums left over unreacted. OK. And so now we know how many moles of boron that we can actually make. Then what we can do. All right. Is that then we could take this number and then we could convert it to grams. All right. So we could convert this number to grams. So we'll have 67.6 moles of boron. All right. And so looking at the um, looking at the periodic table um, and looking at the molar mass, we get that 10.8 grams of boron. The molar mass of boron is 10.8 grams per one mole of boron. So molar boron will cancel out. And then when you multiply this, you will get that you get 730 grams of boron. All right. And so um, that's that. OK, so now let's talk about percent yield. OK, what is percent yield? What's the purpose of percent yield? So percent yield, um, when you're actually doing a chemical reaction, sometimes errors take place. OK, uh, for a variety of reasons, it may be due to experimental, maybe um, uh, it may be due to equipment. It may be due to user error, whatever the case is. Um, and so percent yield gives us a ratio or percentage of how much of the of the actual product was formed versus theoretically how much of the product should have been formed. OK, and so the the equation for this for percent yield is actual um, it's the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. OK, now let's talk about what each of these things stand for and where you get them from. So the actual yield in in all aspects, right, you can only get this from the experiment itself. It's not something that you could calculate because you don't know how much you're really going to make or how much of the product is really going to form. You don't know, you know, exactly what accidents could have happened during the process or what user errors could have happened. So this comes from the experiment. All right. I guess from class purposes, this comes in the problem. I will have to tell you this number. OK. Now, theoretical yield is a calculated number. OK, so you could calculate theoretically how much you're supposed to make. Right. And so, for example, of this equation that we were looking at earlier between bar uh, boron oxide and magnesium, our theoretical yield is 730 grams of boron. So theoretically speaking, I should be able to produce 730 grams of boron. No more, no less. All right. So this is my theoretical. All right. So I'm not going to even try to spell this word anymore. <laughs> so this is my theoretical. Um, dot, dot, dot. All right. So seeing that, let's go ahead and just come up with a scenario um, in this case. So let's say you go in the lab and you're actually, you know, reacting boron oxide with magnesium. OK. And it turns out at the very end, when you get your boron, that you end up getting about 680 grams of boron. All right. That's how much you produced. OK. Now you're trying to figure out what is the percent yield. All right. Compared to my theoretical. So if this is your actual yield. All right. What you actually make from the experiment, 680. And then we know from the math that we did earlier that 730 grams is our theoretical yield. Well, then this is our equation. Actual divided by theoretical times 100. So what you will simply do is 680 divided by 730 times 100. OK, so when you put this in the calculator, you'll get you'll get 93 percent. So that simply means that you actually recovered 93 percent of the theoretical um, yield. All right. So I guess depending on the application, this may not be that bad. You know, as I said, just depends on the application itself. All right. So that's how you go about with um, percent yield. All right.